Hey everyone, today we're taking apart one of the most expensive RTX 2080 Ti's on the market, and that is the RTX 2080 Ti FTW3 by EVGA, following up their long-standing FTW3 lineup of about one generation. But this one is particularly interesting because it's quite a bit different from the past FTW3s. The faceplate has had a change for better or worse, depending on how you feel about that. It's a lot fatter, and the uh, PCB space is pretty densely populated, as you'll see when we take this apart. Separately, we have another video coming up of a PCB analysis of this board by Buildzoid, so make sure you subscribe to catch that if you haven't already subscribed. So then, I think it's about $1,300 plus for this card. Let's take it apart and see why it's so expensive. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly and their high-end thermal compounds. Thermal Grizzly makes cryonaut paste for high thermal performance and conductivity without being electrically conductive, so you don't have to worry about shorting components. Cryonaut is particularly good for replacing stock GPU pastes, as cryonaut is a non-curing compound. Learn more at the link in the description below. So for the board layout, pretty straightforward. Three fan cooler. I think there is an ICX version of one of, of these, but I don't know if this is one of them. We'll, we'll find out though as we get into it. And then it's got a BIOS switch for normal and OC mode. It does default into normal mode and we'll just flip that over so you can read the text on it. Normal, OC, they even oriented it correctly so that in a normal case you can read it. So that's kind of small attention to detail. This over here, 12 volt GRB header. Uh, so that corresponds to the pinout for, obviously, an RGB header. So you can plug this into a system right there and synchronize the LEDs with uh, other strips of LEDs in your case if you wanted to, if that's the kind of thing you're into. And then also over there, there's an auxiliary, uh, auxiliary fan plug, which is right around there. It's a four pin PWM plug, so you could attach a fan to it and then slave that fan to the GPU if you wanted to increase or decrease the speed based on the video card's temperatures. The cooler is obviously very fat and a large part of the cost of high-end cards like this. This is about a 2.75 to 3 slot. Is this a full 3 slot? This is, yeah, this is basically a full 3 slot card. So it's 2.75 for the thickness of the shroud and the cooler. And then once you look at the actual slot requirement, it is a 3 slot card. So a very large card. Uh, some fat heat pipes in there as well. We'll measure those once we get into it and tear it down. So you can see five on this side and then there might be more and we'll, we'll look into that. And then for the power, there are two eight pin connectors. So let's take it apart. This one's an EVGA device, pretty easy to take apart. So uh, first of all, we remove the screw that's near the tamper seal, but it is not a warranty void if removed sticker. So uh, EVGA uses that to figure out if they need to replace the, the paste or not on a card that's come back in to be recertified or something like that, but they don't void your warranty as they've told us anyway, if you stab through that sticker. And we've got four of the spring tension screws. Actually, these ones I'm taking out now don't even need to come out yet. The way EBJ does their mounting now, it's actually really simple. So you can just remove these four. Okay. That should do it, yep. So you remove those four on these EVGA cards now, and you can free the entire cooler, which is actually pretty nice from an ease of installation standpoint. You see it's completely free right now. The uh, thing holding us back is gonna be three cables there. So three fan cables, and then uh, an LED cable on the other side. So we need to disconnect those. We have a piece of a thermal pad here. So that's how easy it is to take those off these days. Four screws. And once we're in there, you can see where that piece of thermal pad goes when we're ready to put that back. Let's start with the cooler, and then we'll go to the base plate, because that's pretty interesting too. So for the cooler, they are using several heat pipes of varying sizes, which we can measure. These are about 10 millimeter pipes, these flat ones right here. So those, those larger ones are, uh, let's see, 10 millimeters up towards this side of the device. And then that's gonna be 10, that's an eight, eight millimeter pipe on that one. So eight and 10 for the most part with a couple of smaller ones in here. And if you look at them, there's actually a lot of, a lot going on. So through the uh, board left side of the heat sink where the VRM is situated, we've got one heat pipe going straight through the cold plate. This doesn't contact the GPU 
ever. Uh, and I don't believe it comes into contact with the memory. No, definitely. Well, hmm. I'm going to go with no on that. It doesn't come into contact with the memory, which is actually kind of obvious because that pipe is situated under the two screw holes, and those two screw holes are going to be where uh, it mounts to the no-go, the keep-out zone for SMDs. So that doesn't cover anything. It just kind of goes into the plate and might provide some additional sinking power. What really matters is the coverage of heat pipes over the GPU itself. And so for that, they've got this fat one, this 10 mil goes through there. And that uh, continues through the VRM side of the heat sink. There's this smaller pipe, which looks like it is this one. So that goes right through the core as well. This smaller pipe goes through the perimeter of the core and this one does not. And then for the rest, that small heat pipe, actually that one continues. Where does this one go? This one goes through the other edge of the core and that continues through most of the heat sink as well, terminating right here, whereas the others terminate over here. So a bit of a difference on where those heat pipes end. For the fin stack, so this is done a few different ways. EVGA has got three types of fins they're using primarily. They have the L-shaped fins, which are right here. So you can find these on a lot of cards where uh, you typically you want to provide more service area to something. For example, providing some service area to the heat pipes. So that allows these to contact the fins fully. They are typically soldered to the fins and that allows for better heat transfer into the fins so that as these heat pipes, these, if you don't know, these use a, a capillary action and phase change. So uh, there's a liquid in there. It goes through a phase change as it hits the hot area, the core. So a cha phase change from liquid to a gas. You lose a lot of energy there, uh, or you lose a lot of heat there in the form of energy in that phase change process. And then as it phase changes into a gas, it will uh, sort of translate up this heat pipe to the end where it then recondenses at the end and, and will uh, trickle back down through capillary action, at which point it can be recycled. So connecting the heat pipe to these L-shaped fins gives it a bit more surface area and that heat can better dissipate into the large aluminum fin stack from the copper heat pipe, uh, which makes better overall use of the materials on the surface. There are also the flat 90 degree fins where there's no bend at all. These are useful for allowing more airflow through the fins. So you see those over on this side of the board primarily, where uh, really all, the, all it's doing is allowing the air to go through and hit the base plate on the board, which is uh, aligned right there. So it hits the base plate, uh, provides some cooling over some of the MOSFETs over here, or sorry, the inductors over here, and then the, uh, the primary inductor line and MOSFETs are contacting these um, sort of 45 degree angle fins, and those, allow air to get through while still providing some additional contact area uh, once it squishes into a thermal pad. So that's the strategy behind the three types of fins you see here. And then the, this stuff in the middle is just a brace where it's all connected. They're sort of interwoven so they come together. If you take them apart, they almost come apart like a zipper. And that's, that covers those. Um, these are color-coded primarily for internal use, I think. So they've got some markings on the sides of the fan headers not something you need to worry about. And then there's your LED cable down there. As for the fan, so the fan down in there is a PowerLogic fan. We actually interviewed them previously, uh, or well, we, we spoke with them at Computex in Taiwan this year. And the way I know it's a PowerLogic fan is because the sticker down there says PowerLogic. <laughs> and um, whether or not the camera can see it, it's a, it's a PowerLogic fan. It is a brushless DC motor, of course, and I don't know any of the other specs on it, but if you were curious of what the model number is, let me take this away from the camera. The model number is, let's see, 12 volts, 0 0.55 amps, so that's useful. Model is PLD09220S12H, if you wanted to look one up to buy or something like that. I think that covers most of the cooler, short of disassembling it. I guess there's one more thing I can talk about. These, um, these holes through here, so this started with ICX on EVGA cards following ACX. 
And the idea is just to allow some more air to flow through the internals of the fin stack and escape out on this side of the card of the fin stack. So a bit more airflow changes the surface area characteristics as well um, and presumably helps. In theory, it helps. It's just that you know, theory isn't always reality depending on how small the change it is. And then here's the base plate. So for this one, you've got the uh, sort of, what is this? This uh, aluminum, that might be a steel. Might be a steel material, but it is not a shiny material, so that's good. It's more of a matte finish. Uh, so anyway, this is a, a metal surface that raises off of the aluminum. It might be a steel. We'll check with them for the review and update as necessary. Um, so anyway, this comes into contact with the fin stack with those 45 degree angle fins. You've got your inductor line here and then uh, the MOSFETs are under this part of the plate. So they've got good, good thermal contact to the plate via a thermal pad, which then conducts into the fin stack. And the capacitor banks uh, not even really covered with any direct contact. It's just getting pure airflow, which is plenty for caps because they just need to stay under like 100 degrees or so. 105 or 85 depending on the cap spec, but typically 105C is definitely where you want to be below. So those are fine with just airflow. And the rest of the plate is smooth aluminum, brushed aluminum finish. So they do not have the pin fins as they call them on this. They instead went with a fatter aluminum heat sink uh, rather than taking up more area with the pin fins. So at this point, let's remove the base plate to look at the rest of this. And to do that, we need to take off those uh, take out the screws in the back that I started on earlier. Okay, that's a lot of screws. There are three, mo three more screws to take out hiding in here. Um, so for this thing, you can see that the base plate here has this metal sheet that comes up and that connects to the expansion slot right there. And then three screws in there from the back side and that holds down the plate onto the PCB. So we still need to take those out. So this is where it gets a little interesting. This one I already took apart for photos for Buildzoid. So we already have that on the way. And that means I was prepared for what you're gonna see. <laughs> it's a bit funny, a bit different. So we've done some baseline thermals on this already, but need to attach thermocouples to the uh, MOSFETs like normally for in more in-depth testing. That becomes a bit tricky with this one, but fortunately I already know what this uh, compound is so I can get more of it easily and replace it as necessary. Because what you're seeing here, rather than the usual thermal pad for connection between uh, the plate and the inductors, EVGA is using this stuff. This is a, you can see it's kind of sticky, but not, not uh, liquidy like thermal paste. This is called thermal putty. It's uh, a little under, it's like 1.5 watts per meter Kelvin, something like that. We have the data sheet for it. It's all in Chinese, but we have the data sheet for it. And I can understand the numbers on it. So we're gonna try and get some of this stuff uh, just for future A-B testing, because it'd be kind of interesting. So that's a bit different. And then also interesting is, although not that interesting these days, is the use of um, a heat pipe under this thermal pad, not that uncommon, but there you go. Just another copper heat pipe there, and that connects with the MOSFETs. So that provides some additional cooling capabilities, in theory, uh, to allow the MOSFETs to communicate their energy into the fin stack more efficiently. So we have some of the thermal putty spill over here. I already have baseline um, thermals, and then we'll run more with our thermal couples attached later and replace as necessary. For the MOSFETs, we're already, we're sending all this information, have already sent all this information to Buildzoid, so I'm gonna save that for him. But we do have our actually kind of sweet new uh, magnifying glass that Intel sent for their architecture event. And we've been making real use of it. So this is the most useful media gifts we've gotten in a while. And some of the parts on here that Buildzoid will be walking you through the significance of, uh, and again, subscribe if you wanna catch that, if you already know the, uh, what they do, we have a UP9512P over here and on semi45491, 
The MOSFETs are also on semi. Those are 3170s. Looks like everywhere. And then these MOSFETs over here on the left side of the VRM, kind of unique. These are 3170s as well. There's the memory VRM. So this, they made this really easy for us. You can see on this one that these R22 inductors, these all correspond with V-Core VRM. So you can almost draw a line here uh, at the screwdriver for the memory VRM where you've got another three phases up there. And then you have, I mean, if we're just counting inductors, you've got uh, two, four, six, eight, ten. <laughs> And then there's more over here, so another two, four, six in addition to that. And Buildzoid's going to walk through the layout of this somewhat complex and interesting VRM. Uh, so I'm going to leave that part to him. But on the back side, we have a couple more components as well. In the very least, it allows this, this VRM design allows for spreading out the VRM heat over a very large area, basically the entire PCB, which uh, ultimately means more efficiency in getting rid of that heat. All right, so in EVGA style, thermal pads all over the back and actually putting the backplate to use. So if you have EVGA cards, you know that the backplates get pretty hot. It's actually a good thing because it means it's doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, you want metal things to get hot because it means it's pulling heat away from things that you don't want to be hot. So uh, those have thermal pads for back of the socket, for the memory right there, and then for the whole back of the primary V-Core VRM and VMEM VRM. And then there are a couple more components on here. I'll walk you through that again, Buildzoid's gonna talk in detail on, but another UP9512P, UP75610, another one of them, and another one of them. So like three of those, something like that, or more. And that covers most of the board components. So we'll leave the, the rest of that analysis to Buildzoid's end while I took the Cooler analysis for you. So that's EVGA's FTW3 card. Couple more things on here. There is a one milli ohm shunt resistor over here near the RGB cables or pinout. There's a five milli ohm shunt resistor down here. And then there's a uh, another five milli ohm shunt resistor over here. And then one more five milli ohm shunt resistor on the back. And that one is over here. Which those positions are important if you wanted to do a shunt mod on this and short them. Uh, as for higher power limits and overclocking or something. One of those will correspond to the PCIe slot. Just take a DMM and do a resistance, a continuity check against the 8-pin uh, 12-volt lines to see which shunt resistors correspond to the 12-volt pins, because that's what you want to pull in. You don't want to pull in more power through the PCIe slot. That's bad. Um, so that'd be how you'd do that. But that covers EVJ's FTW3. We'll have a full review at some point. We have Bill Zoid's analysis coming up as well. So again, subscribe for that one. Subscribe for the full review. And uh, make sure you don't double subscribe, though, because then you'll end up unsubscribed. But you can triple subscribe if you want. So subscribe for more or don't, depending on if you have already done so. And you go to store.gamersaccess.net to pick up a mod mat like the one I worked on during this video or a shirt like the one I'm wearing. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.